All right then, well, everybody, welcome to Paddlecast. This is the first of a series of shows brought to you by British Canoeing. Hope they're going to be really fun and cool, bit of inspiration and probably some fun things to think about during this crazy time. We've got an exciting series lined up for you all. This is going to be the first of six episodes that's going to be coming to you every single week. We are recording this first episode, but after next Thursday, the 7th of May, we're going to be going out live on British Canoeing's Facebook, on a Twitter and on YouTube channels at 7 p.m. So 7th of May, 7 p.m., we're going to be out live. So on our live episodes, what's going to happen is we're going to give British Canoeing members the opportunity to throw in their questions to our guests and maybe they'll even kind of join us from their uh, own living rooms, depending where you are and, and what you're up to. So we've got some cool show. We've got some great guests coming up um, over the next few weeks. We're going to talk a little bit about that later in the show. But for now, I'm really excited because we've got two cool guests with us tonight to kick things off with two cool people. These guys are really pushing the limits of our sport all across the globe. They're taking paddle sport to new places, to new locations and really pushing what is possible in a boat. So I'm really excited to be joined by Sal Montgomery, who's Hello. somewhere here in Nottingham. I don't know quite where. And Bren Orton <laughs> over there in Warrington. So thanks for coming on, guys. It seems particularly tricky to get hold of people, despite the fact that they're locked in their houses at the minute. So I think it's really cool <laughs> to spend the time to, to come in tonight. So um, I'm going to introduce Sal first. So Sal actually started paddling in the Scouts, like me, which is cool. We love Scouts. <laughs> And Sal is a physio, trained physio, but at the moment she's working for the NHS, which is really nice as well. I think great credit to you for that, Sally. So Sal started off in the GB freestyle team and she did it until the age of 25. But then she started uh, going to in, into expedition. She did her first expedition to Nepal after one of the people who was supposed to go dropped out. And after that, she's paddled all over the world, Russia and Asia, South America, New Zealand, Europe and Canada. And I actually heard, Sal, you've got a nice cheeky little video of one of your adventures in Chile. And I figure we could have a quick watch <laughs> to see what you've been up to. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> so some of these rivers look real sweet. I've got to be honest with you, I kind of, well... <laughs> I've you want to be there right now. <laughs> yeah, I've not done much of this sort of paddling. You know, I'm a slalom paddler, but when I've had the chance, you know, I just love hopping off things just like you're doing there. Yeah, and Chile is an awesome place for it. This was actually from my first trip to Chile. Um, so I was um, kind of learning the ways, uh, working out what rivers to go to, at what levels and things. Um, and to be honest, there's just so much over there. Like, I can't even describe how much there is over there and... Uh, how varied it all is. Uh, definitely what was that happened. hanging onto your paddle just then? Was that, uh, a, that was a, humming, a hummingbird? Oh right, wow! Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is the Rio Claro, which is like one of the most special rivers over there. Yeah, um, probably one of the highlights from my trip, actually. Is that kind of odd because it's that like these sort of narrow little shoots and stuff? Yeah, and it's just basically. Uh, clean waterfall after clean waterfall so flat pool into a drop into another flat pool uh, and one section in particular has 22 clean waterfalls in a row uh, oh, wow. so pretty spectacular so you just hop off all of those 22 one at a time and yeah yeah they're all slightly different some are a bit harder than others and things uh, but generally they're all super clean and really fun um, and you can just lap it all day long it's awesome and what's the story with those horses? Are they kind of roaming around wild in Chile as well? Yeah, so that was actually in Argentina, because um, this particular oh. year there had been a landslide across the main road uh, that would take you from kind of northern Chile down to Futalifu. Uh, so we made the most of that situation and road trips through Argentina to get down to Futalifu. Um, and yeah, the, the, the scenery was just spectacular. And as you could see, wild horses running around and the mountains and we actually caught a couple of cool rivers along the way as well which uh, just made it uh, even cooler trip really oh yeah man it just looks yeah uh, just love yeah the, the, all those sliding along and jumping off things it just looks yeah. awesome. <laughs> there's a bit of everything over there you've got waterfalls you've got steep creeks and then you've got big volume you've got fruit of the food baker uh, so just a bit of everything really um, mm. but loads of world-class kayaking and mud yeah oh, 
Turn it off, Mark. Turn it off. We can't be having no spiders. <laughs> we'll do that. We don't want to scare people. <laughs> so yeah, and it's like so. One of the cool things I think that's happened relatively recently is that we were with Stephen Backshaw, the yeah. legend Stephen Backshaw in Bhutan to explore the uncharted rivers around there. And uh, mm. I guess you've also got a really cool uh, kind of history with him. I, I think you've done quite a few things with him. Is that right? Um, we've started doing more and more recently. Uh, unfortunately, our training uh, kind of got put on hold a little bit with the lockdown. Um, but yeah, Bhutan was our first uh, kind of adventure together. Uh, and that was checking out the Chamkarcho River, which was actually the last unrun river in Bhutan. Uh, so quite a big adventure, as you can imagine. Um, and yeah, uh, in a beautiful place, some really good white water. Um, and then from then on, it's kind of just got the site going for more um, and some future plans. So yeah, watch this space. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, Steve Backshaw, absolutely love the guy. I think he's an absolute gem. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool him and like, I guess it's uh, yeah, super, super nice. Yeah. So I'm going to introduce now Brent because I guess uh, Brent is one of these people. If you've been around the canoeing scene, you'll have seen him around as well. He lives in Warrington, but he gets around quite a lot. He's uh, started paddling um, really early on on a trip into the Lake District I've got here. And uh, I guess from there, man, you've gone on to do some of the most um, – I say ridiculous in the kind of friendliest and, and most generous <laughs> route, a sense of the word, some of the craziest stuff I've seen on a river before, you know, you've kind of combined big river paddling and freestyle stuff together. And I guess that kind of comes from your your background in those, well, I guess you started, did you start more in freestyle? Mate, I, I started same as I think a lot of people will, you know, you start out on the lake and you go to white water and then people are trying to get you to try certain disciplines and, um, I remember I tried slalom and I, I remember I quite enjoyed it until I saw someone go vertical for the first time. And I was like, that, that is what I want to do. <laughs> and then, do, right? Yeah. And then I was like, I don't care about going fast. I just want to be vertical. And then from mm -hmm. that, I got into freestyle. And then um, from going to all the freestyle events, normally there's like off days in between. So you could either stay and rest with a freestyle comp or you could go out and you can go creaking and river running in between. So I ended up doing that in America and, and, I remember my first time in, in a creek boat. I just fell in love with it. I was like, this is magic. And so, like, I, th I guess, you know, it seems to me, you know, some of the things you've done, I guess, can we have a watch of your, like, show reel as well? We may as well get that. Yeah, mate, of course. It seems to be quite, uh, you know, some quite remarkable stuff that you've done in terms of combining, you know, doing freestyle stuff that in, in some, some, some incredible places. And I, I guess that's, do you consider yourself to be kind of an innovator in this area? Yeah, I mean, it's hard, you know, because, you know, there's been so many good kayakers from all sorts of generations. And um, but yeah, like the, the new school side of things, we're calling it free ride, you know, and it's sort of yeah. like, you know, it's, it's, it's doing tricks and stuff down rivers that people would normally be in creek boats and, and would be gripped in, you know, and um, yeah. I'm really enjoying it, mate. I think I think that's my favorite type of kayaking at the moment is using one kayak to sort of do it all and to, and to just blend all the different styles and types of kayaking together. Yeah. I mean, just watching this video here just looks like, uh, it looks like wicked fun, but slightly terrifying. I mean, that's cool. I need to <laughs> kick flip is one of my sort of uh, skills. I need to sort of develop at some point. I'm really like, Oh man, I need to learn how to do that. I, I've had a few moments, a few flirtations with it, but I've, you've obviously got it pretty locked down. Yeah, dude, I've, I've been loving seeing you get in a freestyle kayak. It's been cool to see. Really cool uh, to see, mate, when I go down long, the park. Man. It's too long since I've been on my in my freestyle kayak, for sure it is. And tell me, I saw this clip earlier, man, going down. I just love going down that pipe. That must have been a wickedest fun to do. I just think that's super cool. <laughs> yeah, dude, the, the tunnel drop in Norway is pretty wild. It's it's one of those, it's really, it's it's like a really unique piece of white water. And it's 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 pretty chill. It doesn't take that much skill. You just want to keep the kayak underneath you and ride over all those bumps. But mm. if you do flip, it's pretty mean. Oh yeah. So it's definitely a sort of don't mess it up sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, you'd be all right, but you definitely bump your head. Yeah, man. So I'm just looking at it. I'm, I'm terrible. When I see moving images, I have to stop speaking. Otherwise I kind of yeah. uh, get distracted. You're all good, mate. So. You're all good. No, and so, like, I think this uh, it's really cool just to have both of you in the same room together because I guess, you know, you're both paddling at a real high level and just seeing 
you know, the, the, the paddling that you're doing has kind of brought a, a smile to my face and thinking, oh, you know, this is wicked. And I just wonder, Sal, you know, how, how's it been for you during this lockdown? I guess you've been working quite a bit. Has uh, that kind of distracted yeah. you from, from paddling a bit? or? Well, it's been a, a, dif- a definitely a big change of plan. Um, I'm actually meant to be in Nepal right now. Um, mm. And then when I got back, I was pretty much straight onto another trip uh, and kind of a busy summer. Uh, but obviously all of that kind of got cancelled overnight. Um, and I headed back to Nottingham uh, to go back to help in the NHS like I used to do before. Um, so it's all a very different uh, kind of lifestyle to what I'd expected for this time of year. Um, but just kind of make the most of it, really, like training uh, before and after work, ready for when we can get back on the water again. So when you say training, what 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 do you mean? Um, in the mornings before work, uh, I'm actually I'm getting up at 4:45, uh, yeah, uh, to fit in a run, uh, and then at work uh, we've been doing some little workouts at work, but uh, they're pretty short. And then afterwards, um, doing more like a strength and conditioning kind of um, like exercise routine. No way. So, on what what sort of work? Just because I'm naturally want to know what sort of work mm. you're doing at the moment in the HS. Is it? Is it? Um. Well, I I um I don't do a huge amount of respiratory physio. I haven't done for quite a long time. Uh, obviously, with all my traveling and things, um, it's something that I've kind of not prioritized. So, I am seeing a lot of orthopedic patients. So, people that have perhaps had to like. At the moment, we've had a lot of kind of elderly people falling over and breaking hips and stuff. So I've been mm-hmm. kind of helping them, helping to get them back on their feet, at uh, their feet, um, which in turn frees up some of the other physios that are more specialised in respiratory, so they can go and help with the the more um, sick patients, basically. Wow. Uh, obviously, there's quite a high demand uh, for physios in ITU at the moment, so the more physios we can free up on the ward to send it to ITU, the better, really. Well, I don't think anyone will be disagreeing with me if I say thank you very much, because I guess oh, we, know that, we know that there's a massive team effort going on out there, and I suppose this yeah. sort of crisis has kind of shown what you know what's important and, and how, how much we rely on each other. And actually, like you're saying, how even in the physio, you'd say, what does a physio do in COVID-19? But actually, mm-hmm. you're really helping there. So, yeah, that's super, super cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And so has it been difficult to train? Have you found it like sort of, um, um, hard, you know, has it been, has it been, has it been therapeutic? Or yeah, I think it's actually been um, pretty essential. Um, work is definitely, like working at the hospital is different to usual at the moment, obviously. Mm. Um, I'd say people are, are dealing with it quite well, but obviously, um, as expected, people are scared, they're kind of they're stressed, they're working hard, they're maybe working loads of extra hours um so it's it's actually um really nice to kind of release all of that and just kind of switch off from it all um and exercise just take your mind off it all um but also knowing that you're using this time so obviously I, like a lot of kayakers right now um i was pretty disappointed when kind of plans got cancelled and things um uh, but it kind of makes me feel better knowing that at least in this time I can be working towards some other goals ready for when we can get out and Mm. um, kind of take up some of these adventures kind of in the future Um, and obviously I was very just like disappointed to start with but then working at the hospital kind of like puts things in perspective and you realize actually like there's a lot worse things going off right now so um, yeah. Yeah and Brent and Brent what was it like for you mate when you kind of realized that this wasn't going to work this year, just wasn't going to work out the way that, that you were you were hoping it to? I mean, same as everyone else, mate. It's frustrating, but, I mean, it, it is what it is, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, it was just a mess, mate, because, like, one of my big things has been we used to do things a few years ago a bit more off the cuff, you know, like plans would just sort of happen. And with all that, you'd always be dealing with stuff last minute and, and you sort of have to with, with this side of the sport because you're always chasing the best water levels. Oh, um, yeah. But the last like 18 months, we've been trying to get more organized. We're trying to line up bigger film projects and all of that stuff. And and so I had like a bunch of things in the pipe works for the next six months at least. And then, um, yeah, since it's been canceled, it's just been dealing with all the all the rubbish side of that. Like, I call it adulting. You know, <laughs> like but, you know it's, it, yeah, it's the side of life that I hate, you know, like cancel plans, like 
postpone plans, cut budgets, you know, like got to get your money back for your flights and all that stuff. But I think as, as, as rubbish as it is, I would say that most, I feel like most of the world are handling it pretty well. Mm. You know, like I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm, I'm really, really impressed, especially in England with the outlook of it from, you know, 99% of people of like, this mm. is, this is not, this is not the ideal situation for me, but I'm going to do it to help out other people. I think that's a really nice, a really nice thing to see. Yeah, it certainly seems to have like, I don't know, I think that uh, I guess people have seen a different feeling, you know, and a different connection with each other. And, you know, just even doing things like this is quite dif different. You know, so I, I've known both of you for quite a while, actually, and this is one of the probably longest chats we'll get to have. And, and so it's lovely. There's, there's opportunities in this really kind of difficult time. And, I suppose, Bryn, I was thinking to, you know, do you do you have a training program? I can't see you getting up at 4.45 for a run. Oh, but I may have really miss, miss, miss uh, sold you. I don't know, mate. What's the story? Tell me. Not Correct. normally, mate. I mean, I mean, the stereotype is always like, you know, like lazy freestyle person or whatever, you know, like coming from. I wouldn't say that. From no, a... man, I wouldn't say that. I was just okay. saying 4.45 in the morning. That is some different. That's a different thing. Nah, mate. I'm, I'm more like 4.42, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no i mean i'll get i'll get up early if i have to i normally get up at like half seven eight but i'll get up early if i have to and um yeah i mean normally my normal routine is get up smash out some editing on my computer and then go kayaking and then come home and train do some more editing and then go to bed and uh that's basically my routine now just without the kayaking <laughs> so as soon as i get done editing. With my <laughs> they editing editing, editing. Yeah, editing, and then I go hang the gymnastic rings up and do. I know I've been training like six times a week, although I felt rubbish the last two days, so I haven't been. But I've been doing like push, pull, legs, and then normally a rest day, and then push, pull, legs again. And then um, been trying to go running more, which is something I hate doing. I hate long distance <laughs> running, but I've been, I've been making myself do it. <laughs> it's all right. I hate running if you're a kayak or a canoeist. I think it just it's not quite right. I like running. running. But, yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, I think when you're when you're uh, just don't, I, I've I've got into running a bit more since I retired. I think just because it's just having to lug less all my muscles around. <laughs> I left them behind when I retired, and now I can go running. So, Brenda, you take that sort of strengthening quite seriously. I mean, some of the stuff you're running, you know, you're going to get an absolute kick in. You got to be well put together for that, right? And that is that sort of the strength side of it. Is it for performance or is it for kind of resilience and toughness sort of? Thing? So sort of sort of for it all you know like i want to be you know on one side of things i want to be as explosive and powerful as i can be you know like a gymnast or something or mm. you know, even a slalom racer you know just like when i when i take a stroke and i do a movement in my kayak i just want it to be like really powerful and um, and then yeah you know like taking the impacts off big waterfalls you look at the lads that take hits like in rugby or american football and they're all big strong lads you know Mm. So that side of things, I'm trying to put on a bit of mass to hold me together. And then <laughs> the, the other side of things is just safety. You know, like when I started running harder white water, the crew I was with, they pulled me out of a couple of situations and got me safely off the water just by being strong, athletic people that moved quickly. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. There's one video I remember watching you and it looked like you were going oh, to kind of go off that sort of thing. And oh, like, mate. Kind of you out and i remember watching that thinking that was really really horrible and, and it's interesting that you make that link i would never have kind of seen that sort of athleticism as being a sort of safety kind of uh, issue yeah mate i mean that that save that dave facilli pulled off you know i was for, pe for people that haven't seen it i was i was 17 or 18 years old and I, we were running this this waterfall on the on the olympic peninsula called hammer hammer and it's a 20 foot waterfall to a 60 foot waterfall. And there's a cave on the left in between the two. And I messed up the first 20 footer and got pushed into the cave and uh, panicked, had never been pushed up against the wall and not been able to roll and all of that stuff. And I swam and I got like sucked into this cave and my legs are like on the other side of the cave. And I'm like oh. almost about to get swept over the falls. And Dave manages to like climb out of his kayak, balance on this like this rock ledge, this tiny slippery rock ledge, throw his throw rope like thirty feet across the river and reel me in before I went off the lip. And uh, I genuinely like a like a less athletic person, I don't think they could have done it. Mm. Nice. It was interesting to see Sally's face. I think it was the same as mine. I, was... <laughs> I just hate the sound of the <laughs> <laughs> that emoji. Oh. Uh. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and, and it's interesting because, you know, as a, as, a, as a former slalom paddler, I never really did, you know, very dangerous stuff, you know, and it's some of this stuff just watching it kind of makes my, makes my, makes me feel a bit cold and, and sweaty. So credit to, <laughs> credit to both of you. And so I was kind of thinking as well, it'd be interesting, you know, because I guess uh, right now people are, are thinking to themselves, you know, the days are kind of getting weird, right? You know, people are, you know, like you say, brain just editing, doing some stuff and then editing some more and people are on their computers all day or Sal's doing a work and then come in and run in, you know, kind of days are kind of the, the, the routine. But are you kind of, do you find yourself daydreaming about, you know, paddling going forward or paddling going back and where does your mind take you? Oh, mate, I'm, I'm always plotting the next thing. So, oh, yes, yeah. yeah, same, same old situation as always, you know, like I'm always looking up rivers I want to go down, waterfalls I want to drop, and then video projects I want to make happen. So it's been nice to have the time of that. But I think I think it's funny how it, like, sort of comes in waves, you know, like a couple of days a week, I'm like, yeah, all this time I'll get all this done, and, you know, I'm quite productive. And then, and then that feeling goes, you know, and then I'm just like, <laughs> oh, I can't wait to get back on the water. Yeah. <laughs> and what about you, Sal? Do you do a bit of daydreaming? Is that kind of good medicine yeah. for you? Yeah, I don't know about you, Bren, but like maybe it's more so with like the endurance training and things. Like I use um like my motivation for training is kayaking. Uh, like Bren said, there's loads of reasons you do off the water training for your kayaking, but for most of us that's the reason we're doing it. Uh so I kind of fantasize about future paddling a lot. Um, and that helps me to kind of push harder with my training because it's got like a purpose to it. Um, but yeah, I've definitely um, been putting some thought into where's next when we might eventually kind of get out of these restrictions and we're able to travel again and things and kind of weighing up options and possibilities. But it's, yeah, it's kind of hard because obviously we don't know exactly uh, what's going to happen and when, but um, I think if you can start to at least loosely plan in your head where you might go at this point in the year, then it's awesome to have things to look forward to and things to start planning and putting the research into and, um, yeah, just kind of getting the drive going again. Are you having, like, conversations with people? Are you, like, chatting on Facebook or whatever, speaking to people, going, oh, you know, what about this, what about that? Or is it kind of because it's sometimes it's a bit cruel to, you know, to kind of just yeah. dream and not actually do anything about it? You know? <laughs> um, a, a bit of a mixture. I would say I do a lot of um, – I can be a bit antisocial sometimes. Um, and I do quite a bit of planning uh, myself. Um, I like to kind of research and look into things and get maybe a little bit obsessed with stuff um, and then perhaps start to kind of share the idea with a few friends. Uh, but then there's equally some like joint projects um, that we did have in the pipeline, which obviously now we're unsure whether we'll be able to reschedule or have to cancel altogether. But uh, we're like frequently in talks about those and just kind of waiting to see what happens um, and then kind of plan as able when we get a bit more information but yeah the the trips are always on the mind and always kind of what we're working towards so you've been I mean, planning what? chunky then so oh go on go on go on Brent. no sorry mate i mean one, one thing i was gonna say mate is like it's the same for you right when you were racing in the olympics all the visualization yeah you know like that's so important and it works and uh i think for myself as a kid i was always just daydreaming you know it didn't matter what i was doing but my mind would just naturally wander <laughs> to go and kind of with my friends and it still does that i'm just trying to be a bit more specific of where it wanders to but i i genuinely i think that i think that that stuff is so so useful that like even if you can't go kayaking just just daydreaming about it visualizing whatever you want to call it just thinking about it i think helps so much when you do get to go back in the kayak just just something i've done when i've been injured and off the water before i think there's a massive difference between sitting on the couch and not thinking about kayaking to sitting on the couch and thinking about kayaking i think it yeah. helps so much yeah. yeah it can feel like a kind of productive thing i guess there's no kind of painful painful <laughs> thinking about things and is actually thinking about things kind of proactively when you think actually and it's interesting to hear you say that because i guess one of the things i admire about 
I guess freestyle especially um and I suppose what you're you're doing on the on the free ride stuff is a kind of creative side you know and thinking about oh what could I do and and, and I suppose that's where daydreaming is really you know interesting and, and have you come up with anything cool that we should be keeping our eye out for? <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a couple there's a couple there's a lot of stuff I want to try but the next couple of video projects I get to do if I manage to get out to the places I want to do them in I think will be quite special so I'm, I'm excited mate. So do you come out from a sort of video project style? Do you kind of have a, you know, do you have a quite strong images about what you want to do or what you want to see? And then you kind of come back to it and figure out where you can do those things. Or is it a totally chicken and egg, like, you know, like, I don't know, like a, a band figuring out a new tune or something. It's got to be kind of, a, you know, round, 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 round. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it comes through all places, through all sorts of stuff, you know, like sometimes I'll see like a waterfall or a rapid and I'll be like, Ooh, you know, like you could do that, and then you could do that, and then you could do that. Or I'll see, I'll see a movement in another sport and be like, oh, you know, like that. Okay. That's how that works. You know, maybe I'll maybe I'll try and take that to my kayaking, or I'll watch another kayaker do something. I'll be like, oh. <laughs> mm. And what sports do you do? Out of interest, what sports do you kind of watch that you can kind of draw that 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 inspiration from? Because that's really fascinating. Because I think that's the sort of movement, isn't it? How you use your body and how you 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 kind of interpret the the energy that's in the water. I guess is so totally, mate. I think for myself, the, the sports I enjoy most watching just just for the rotations are BMX and surfing. Like the new the new school side of surfing, what they're doing with the aerial tricks off the lip, it's stunning. It's so so impressive. And it's cool because you, you can see how they engage the rail and carve up, carve up the wave. And uh, and the BMX stuff, it's just mind-blowing to watch how they just, they don't even, with with a lot of things, it's so important to spot your landing. But if you look at what, I mean, he's not a BMXer, he's, he rides a mountain bike, but if you look what Nikolai Rogatkin is doing, he's rotating so fast. There's no way you can see his landing. Mm. You know, he's just, <laughs> he's, just go, he's just going off the lip, hooking as hard as he can, waiting until he counts three spins in the air and then slowing down to the fourth one to land it. It's, it's some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen. And what about you, Sarah? Where do you draw your inspiration from for your, for your paddling? Do you, do you look at it at adventurous? Do you look at, like, places and countries, or is it how, how does that come to you? Uh, it's really variable, really. Um, I know a lot of my, uh, my more recent kind of trips has been that I've gone somewhere that I've perhaps wanted to go for a while and I've been doing some research and then finally kind of got everything in place and I've gone. Uh, and then once I'm there, you kind of, you meet other people, you talk to people about their experiences in other countries and with rivers or uh, you chat about like, oh, I've seen this river um, or I've seen this, um, at this section that's not been done before and you just kind of between you get excited about uh, different kind of ideas and plans and then you kind of just go off in a direction um, of starting to put like research and plans together and things um, but yeah it definitely varies um, I tend to without kind of trying I tend to leave a trip already thinking about the next place that I want to go um, and already like looking into it and things so it kind of just naturally flows without really trying mm. uh, there's just always like loads of excitement and psych going on for lots of new places people are being like way more adventurous and exploring and people are kind of chasing a bit more which is cool um and you can't help but kind of get excited about that and get drawn into it too so. and so I, I don't know i guess you probably can't say too much but you said something earlier on about like i got the impression you were kind of doing training with Steve Backshaw, you know, you, are you working together, sort of like developing your skills together and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, um, I don't think Steve would mind me saying um, that he has uh, recently had um, some so shoulder surgery. Um, mm. He's recovering from that and he's doing really well. Um, so he um, got the go ahead for getting back into kayaking again. So we kind of put together a bit of a training regime uh, to build him up. Uh, and then start um, kind of working on uh, more advanced skills and more like river experience, rescue skills and stuff, um, ready for kind of future expeditions. Um, I'd say things have been put on hold, but hopefully they can recommence and um, kind of we can start working towards those goals again. But. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, injuries. I, I was going to ask you about that because I heard, you know, Bren talk about injuries. And, mm. and I guess, uh, Al, have you, have you had many injuries from paddling as well? Um, I've had a few shoulder injuries um, 
in particular, um, probably be a year before last now, um, I was trying to do an ear dip on a waterfall messed it up and tore through two rotator cuff muscles and the labrum or the cartilage of my shoulder uh, so mm. i needed quite extensive surgery um oh, but like God. I say, yeah <laughs> i also carried on paddling with it for a month on the futa whilst it was like hanging off so that oh. probably didn't do it too much good but uh but it's the futa so <laughs> did you feel uh, like you didn't have a choice did you were like well this isn't ideal but yeah, I'll and- I, 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 most people have heard of the futa because it is just like a paddler's paradise um and you kind of can't go there and not paddle um and i had a month set aside to paddle there um mm. so yeah probably kind of irresponsibly but i don't regret it just took painkillers <laughs> and carried on paddling well um, i guess you might argue as a if it's already messed up and totally damaged you yeah. know if you've not got if you're if you're <laughs> if, if it's torn if it's already torn then i guess sometimes yeah. if it's actually functional you can't do anything about it until you've got surgery eh? and i guess yeah. you're not going to get it in chile are you so yeah. and to be science honest, yeah <laughs> well to be honest when i came back to the uk and had the scans done and they told me the the extent of the damage I, I did say to the surgeon, because obviously you, things don't always happen straight away, so they'd said, like, I'd have to wait a little while for the surgery. Uh, and I kind of said, can I cause any more damage? And he was like, no, the damage yeah. is pretty much done. So I, I carried on paddling right up until the surgery. I was still doing freestyle and stuff. Mm. Um, That's so- kind of the angle that I was thinking about, because, you know, what, yeah, the, 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 the structures have been damaged. You can't do anything until they've yeah. been stuck back down, so... If yeah, you're... it felt a bit unstable, but um, yeah, it was perhaps just a bit more careful than usual. Um, but like Bren was saying earlier, like having that drive and the purpose for your training uh, is really good. Because um, after the surgery, it would have been quite easy, I think, to kind of feel sorry for myself and feel like super far away from where I had been previously or where I wanted to be with my paddling. Um, but because I had an expedition coming up, um, and a really tight time frame of being ready for it. It just gave me um, like really structured um, focus, problems. right? Yeah, and I was comp- that was everything. Those few weeks, nothing else mattered. It was just about training and being ready in time to get on that plane. Um, and that was really good for me, I think, because I didn't re- I didn't even really have time to feel sorry for myself because. I had a job to do and not much time to do it. So I think that I think it's pretty healthy uh, to have like lots well, of guess, focused goals and something to work towards and just and like the system, well. system thing too. Like. Yeah. And as you're a physio, you're kind of well positioned to, you know, one of the things about being injured, I guess, is that you have an uncertainty and you don't really know what you're doing. And then I guess you can kind of um, have a little bit of help because you know about yeah. this you can make yourself feel a little bit better because you have a little bit better understanding of the processes involved yeah unless you know like sometimes you can know, much, that yeah. know that it's bad <laughs> yeah yeah fair enough. Um, i'm a pretty bad patient <laughs> i i always appreciate the the healthcare professionals you know doctors nurses physios whatever when when they when they understand like how how athletes are you know and they're like in an ideal world you would do nothing for six weeks however you could (laughs) you could get back in a kayak after three weeks and you'd probably be okay but you want to give it at least two weeks (laughs) i I really appreciate that you know you know where you stand i had the best physio as well because he'd be like okay so you should probably start like uh doing gentle movement uh, at this point and then at this point maybe you could start lifting things the weight of a tin of beans la 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 um and then knowing like knowing me and what I'm kind of interested in he's like okay maybe at this point you could start doing waterfalls but let's see how we go <laughs> like he just understood and uh, he can't he still thought it was a bit mental but he he kind of knew what I was aiming for rather than what maybe someone like the general public would be aiming for so that was and what about you Brent tell me about your well go on just give give us one example of an injury that you've had to deal with (laughs) definitely I had a string of them last year where I think I was just not number one I was not sleeping enough because I was too busy but um, I think I was just I was just not 
fully recovering from an injury and then I try and get back to like top level stuff but I'd be semi-injured and I just get hurt again in another place I had like a few back-to-back -back ones and um, the worst one I've ever had was a fractured skull and a brain bleed and that was uh that was two years ago but yeah that was heavy um that was that was crazy though because in my head because I was so confused from a concussion and the brain injury in my head I was fine like I felt a little bit a little bit sore and stiff as you do after waterfalls, but I felt fine. I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about and I couldn't understand why my friends wouldn't let me go kayaking with them. And uh, ev eventually they made me look in a mirror and my, you know, like my nose was on the other side of my face, like all this was split open. And then, you know, I had all the x-rays and event eventually it clicked how serious it was, but I just, I didn't know fully who I was or what had happened or anything for a, a good few weeks all I know is all I knew is that I really really wanted to go kayaking <laughs> <laughs> that was that was can, the worst injury <laughs> I think we can all identify with that man at the minute I feel it's just uh oh, it's so you know there's going to be people all around the world you know doing all sorts of things that they you know wouldn't normally be doing and thinking oh when am I going to get back out on the water and when am I going to get to do some of this stuff it's it's uh it is it's difficult but I guess it's really interesting because there's a sense of perspective that I think people are really getting hold of and it's kind of like it's, it's really it's really really such an interesting time and I guess it's uh for me it's interesting just to get a chance to chat to you and and, and speak about things and I just wondered um basically when you're going to go out on your next your next trip and you kind of, what is the first thing that goes into your bag that's not a piece of canoeing kit or, you know, something to do with paddling equipment? What's the sort of thing that you want to be out with you that is kind of like, you know, that makes you feel good about being away? That's a tricky question. Have you anyone got something? Is sort of something that reminds you of home or something or what your non, non-essential thing that you would take away with you? Maybe that's... I mean that's tricky. I think I mean like luxury item wise, my number one pick is is a Kindle, um, you know, so I can read books while I'm away. And my second pick is a good set of headphones. But I I class those as essentials, you know. Like I, I can't imagine traveling without them. First world, yeah, good on. Yeah, mate, totally. <laughs> what about you, Sally? Um, I would agree with the Kindle. I read a lot, especially when traveling. Uh, it also helps me sleep because uh, like you can probably relate with Bren, like we're always changing time zones, um, which can mess your sleep up a bit. Whereas reading for me like helps to knock me out no matter what time it is. Um, but I would say the first thing that came to my mind, uh, and a lot of my friends will uh, probably agree with me here, that as soon as I'm away, um, I am straight into kind of uh, my life shorts, so the Jewstone shorts. Uh, particularly the ice cream ones, so the bright yellow and pink ones. And I just live in them basically until I leave. Um, and that's become kind of my signature um, kind of item, I guess, that I'm just living in for the whole trip. They get pretty, pretty kind of abused. By the trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of what I associate. Like, yeah, I'm way packing. The life shorts are on. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I'd probably say most people with kind of flip flops and boardies, like it's like you're away, you're abroad, it's warm, and you're just going kayaking every day. Well, it's funny you're thinking about shorts because apparently, like loads of people, there's been a, a massive rise in the number of people wearing like leisure leisure bottoms, tracky bottoms, and stuff around. <laughs> oh, mate, and I'm prime. I confess to being wearing some right now, so it's a bit <laughs> like those shorts. Mate, prime, prime time. Honestly, <laughs> like. It, it is sort of like well so like, it's like being a little kid again you know like around christmas time you're just like in your pajamas for a few days <laughs> you know like the only person the only person i see from the outside world at the moment is occasionally the postman oh. <laughs> that's it really yeah a couple people want to go out training but not not that many people oh. well <laughs> um all the more grateful for you guys having been here tonight with me uh, for sharing this time together and, and and sharing this your experiences uh with the people who are watching i think it's really really good and i'm really glad thank you for everybody coming to watch this uh, first episode of the paddlecast i want to say thank you to sal and bren for being awesome um, I think we had to stop the discussion before we ended up di diverting into what we're wearing for the next few weeks while we're uh, <laughs> this is about, supposed to be about canoeing, right? Um, 
Next week, on the 7th of May, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be having our first of our live episodes. So what we're going to do then is we're going to have a kind of roundtable chat with people from Peak UK, Palm, Perception and Tutega to talk about how the industry is weathering the current crisis and the future of paddling equipment. So join us on British Canoe and Twitter, YouTube and Facebook at 7 p.m. All the details are going to be published through the usual news channels and social media. We'll be letting people know if they want to be a part of the next episode to ask their questions. But once again, I just want to say thank you so much to Bren and Sal for being here. Thanks to everyone who's uh, helped support and get this set up. But thank you for, for being here. Thanks for listening. Stay safe. Hang in there. Just hopefully not too much longer. And uh, see you again soon. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, mate. Cheers, dude. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,